Ladies and gentlemen, we finally have the complete roster of the Harbingers revealed! I don't think anyone was ready for the Harbinger drop alongside the Simra drip marketing, but here we are! I'm also so happy that I can finally update that really old video of mine about the 11 Harbingers given we got so much information within a year. Ah, how the seasons have changed! Anyway, welcome to the history of the Harbingers, a full breakdown of the 11 Harbingers and their history according to the in-game texts, and many more. There will be some information here based on speculation due to the still mysterious nature of the Harbingers, but regardless, the trailer dropping all of them at once is absolutely shocking. On a side note, I won't be talking about the lore implications of the trailer's speech about checkmates just yet, I'll save that for another video. Anyway, let's begin. I wonder what the rest of the Harbingers are up to. Flotting and scheming on an ever grander scale, no doubt. The Fatui is a Snezhnayan organization formed by the Saritsa and Piero, the first Harbinger. They are situated in the Zapoliarni Palace of Snezhnaya and are considered to be powerful political diplomats of society. The Fatui have connections all across the globe and are revered for their discreet economic, military, and social control over the nations. The organization was formed after the Cataclysm, and presumably gathered its members after that time frame. The motivations of the Fatui vary from the members within, but the core goal of the organization is to bind the remaining days to their delusions so that they may rebel against the heavenly principles. The masks are a symbol that a person abandons their past bonds and forsakes their true name and faces. At the head of the organization are the Eleven Harbingers, People who may or may not have transcended mortal capabilities by harnessing the power of their Archon bestowed delusions. Their powers were given to them directly by the Saritsa, and they are the reason the Fatui can do whatever they want in other nations. All the Harbingers are based off of the Italian theater art called the Commedia dell'arte. In the Commedia, actors and actresses wear masks and take on the roles of the over exaggerated stock character archetypes and then improvise their comedy along the way. According to the lore, the Fatui are separated into several factions under the Harbingers, each with their own purpose. But at the moment, that segregation is unknown. We can always just assume that Harbinger divisions overlap, but most of the time, they work separately. So let's begin with the first Fatui Harbinger, Piero, the Jester. He was the first ever Fatui Harbinger, and today he's our leader. He only appears on important occasions. As for his accomplishments, to be honest, I don't really care. I owe my loyalty and devotion to the Tsuritsa, no one else. Piero was the man responsible for recruiting Signora, Pantalone, and Dottore, and perhaps even the other Harbingers besides Tartaglia as far as we know. But Piero's beginnings in the Mocking Mask Pale Flame set state that he was once from an ancient civilization that couldn't tear away from sin. He tried to convince a foolish king to stop his plans, but because he was not at the level of the sages, he failed to earn the favor of the previous ruler. While it was never confirmed to be Conrian, the Fatui were established after the Cerise's shift after the Cataclysm, and Piero's old civilization was destroyed by a divine rat and the usurped callousness of the foundational principles. Therefore, we can assume that this man is Conrian. How this man lived for centuries most likely coincides with the curse of immortality. We see that his face is covered on one side with a blue mask, and his pupil is a strange star-like shape, almost like Dane and Caius. In the Commedia, Pedrolino is the sad clown motif a man riddled with misfortune that just never gets his way. He's seen as the pathetic and lonely clown, belittled and bullied by the other characters, which serve as a great parallel to the Mocking Mask. However, unlike his lovable Pierrot counterpart, the Jester is a cold and distant man, sometimes even cruel to his own subordinates. The first time we heard of Piero was in a name drop by Scaramouche during the 1.1 Unreconciled Stars event. He didn't warn Scaramouche of the true nature of the meteorites, and Scaramouche surmises that that was just to scare him. In Inazuma, Piero was also mentioned to have instigated the release of the Tataragami, and gave orders that a spy under the name of Nathan be sent to infiltrate the Watatsumi army and sabotage their plans for a quick victory. It's possible that this is also the man responsible for the Delusion's black market plot, while Scaramouche and Signora are simply there to execute it. Piero also doesn't bat an eye to most of the happenings in Yashiori Island, and simply saw the inhabitants as necessary fodder. In the trailer, he mocks the sages that were mentioned in his lore, saying that they think too highly of themselves. This all goes back full circle to Piero's previous role of being shunned by Conrian royalty, which led to the Cataclysm. I am genuinely curious what will happen in the future with him, and how his Conrian origin affects future relations with other Conrian characters. Though, now that I really think about it, Piero would want nothing to do with the Abyss Order, especially if they're evangelists and scholars from Conria. 
After all, he hates the sages that didn't listen to him before. Who is to say that they'll listen to him now? Capitano, the captain. I've seen him in battle before, and oh, what a sight it was. Perhaps I'm ranked too low for him to notice me right now. Well, he may not recognize my strengths yet, but one day, I'll show him what I'm made of. I can't remember why his design looks so familiar to me, but it does. Unlike the other Harbingers, this is the only design that we don't see the face of, which might serve as a narrative antithesis with his commended that are the counterpart. The Capitano is a braggart, a Spaniard who boasts about his successes without actually putting much fact behind it. The Capitano of Genshin seems to be something else entirely though, a hidden man, someone that speaks of honor. He sounds more sympathetic to Rosalind's sacrifice, but we don't know what his true motivations are. According to the in-game lore, however, Victor says that he'd rather work under Capitano than Senora, hinting that he at least has a good standing with his subordinates. Columbina The Fatui Harbingers are ranked by strength, and I have no idea why that girl is number three. I'd test my skills with every Harbinger who ranks above me if I had the chance, but when it comes to her, something just doesn't feel right. Anyway, you should be careful around her. Columbina was a character that was constantly referenced by theorists but was never confirmed until now. The word Columbina, or the damselette, means the little dove, and in the Commedia dell'arte, she is a servant. But she is also the most intelligent person on the stage, and often knows everything about everyone due to her marites nature. We see that in the trailer, she is leaning over the coffin seeing Signora's boss battle theme, and from her design alone, we see the dove aspect of her character. The wings clip on the back of her hair resembles the white dove's wings except given its shape. It actually looks like seraph wings, which honestly, I can see why Tartaglia would be wary trying to fight her. She is definitely much stronger than she looks. When we get to the next scene, we can see her eyes still look closed and the mask a little invisible. I'm not sure if she removed the mask after the song, but regardless, I think her true strength lies within her eyes. I doubt she is human, but what I want to know is that if she has celestial origins. The highlights in her hair facing downwards might suggest something, but until then, it's too early to jump into any conclusions. All we know at the moment is that she is too suspicious to be kept alive. Also, something really weird is that Child says that the Fatui Harbingers are ranked by strength, not seniority. So Child confirms that he's technically the weakest of them all, which does make sense. One is a centuries-old fire witch, and the other is a prototype of a god. What the first to fifth Harbingers are hiding, though, is currently unknown. The Tore I heard that he took segments of himself at different ages, made prostheses out of them, and assigned different tasks to each one. I know. All my comrades are a little weird. Well, come to think of it, if I met my own prosthesis, ha, we'd have to fight then and there to decide which one of us gets to survive. Ah, yes. The man, the myth, the glow-up. The Tore, or the Doctor, is the first ever Fatui Harbinger introduced in Genshin Impact, being revealed all the way from the manga. The Tore is a cruel and sadistic man, the true definition of neutral evil. He was once a scholar of the Sumer Academia, but was shunned. He is willing to experiment on anything and anyone, believing that the apex of human life is simply the mechanization of the human anatomy. He believes that humans are just more complex machines, and if you break a human bit by bit, they can transcend a god. He calls visions self-inflated tools, and is hinted to not have a vision himself. Though, a lot can change in this man of a year. Dottori shares a lot of correlations with the Dottori of the Commedia, all the way to the fact that Dottori likes to speak and bore other characters with their jargon and gibberish. Dottori's division works on experiments, and Dottori used to have a research facility specializing in ruined machine research before he discarded it out of boredom. His division experimented on the children of Sumeru and Mondstadt, as seen in the manga. It's also hinted that he was the one that unlocked Scaramouche's power because Scaramouche's husk of opulent dreams mentions a researcher he adopted his apathetic nature from. What I am really curious about is his connection with the segmental simulacra he created. Child calls them prostheses, which are artificial body parts, such as a leg, a heart, or a breast implant. He made segments of himself at different ages, which means that there's a baby Dittoria somewhere out there just living its life. He refers to these segments in third person, and we see that one of the segments is in front of a large burning tree, a tree that I would assume is something like the Tree of Wisdom. According to Dottore, this segment is busy with a little experiment of blasphemy, 
which is why I think this tree connects heavily with whatever's happening in Sumeru. Also, if it turns out that the Torah is number 4, I'll be really happy. I think I've said this before, but in China, the number 4 is another way to say death, which would make his title of a doctor all the more ironic. Polchinella, the rooster. I don't know what his motivations could be, but he seems genuine about wanting to help me. He treats me just like family. Oh, and speaking of family, Tonya and Tusser are always telling me about the pastries and other gifts he brings them when they write. So while I've been away from Snezhnaya, he's kept his promise to take care of my family. Polchinella as a character is hinted all the way back in the Devat trailer a long time ago, and his playability has been teased for a long time given that pattern. But now looking at him in the trailer, he has the most unique design out of all of them. Polchinella's personality was hinted in Tartaglia's backstory. Polchinella was the one that took Tartaglia in as a Fatui agent under the guise of a punishment, stating that if he wished to serve the Saritza, he must first start from the bottom and work his way up. In Tartaglia's introduction, Polchinella actually mentions that one can trust Tartaglia, but one ought not to get too attached. Polchinella also warns that Tartaglia's lust for battle will be what eventually brings him to his demise. Polchinella speaks cautiously, and we see in the trailer that he's much more mellow compared to the other Harbingers. He does seem to have a close relationship with Tartaglia, that we can discern at the least. Seeing Tartaglia like family and being close with two Antonia. I'm betting that he sees Tartaglia as a nephew or a protege in a way, given that he was the one that brought Tartaglia into the Fatui. Kind of like a proud father figure, but more politically motivated. The problem is that we have no idea how genuine his treatment of Tartaglia is, and by extension, if he truly is as pleasant as we like to believe. In the game, the Fatui trapped in the chasm mentioned that Polchinella is willing to dispense less valuable assets, because that is his logic. The trapped Fatui are direct subordinates of Pulcinella, and he didn't do anything about them being trapped in there. Not to mention, it's hinted Pulcinella assisted in the greater endeavors of attacking Liyue Harbor, meaning Pulcinella is willing to throw away lives for the sake of the Fatui. So don't let the mayor fool you with his glasses and his mustache. Also, uh, mayor. Also, the massive nose could be a hint to his commended Delarte mask, which I will be eternally grateful for. Scaramouche after he took the Gnosis, we lost all contact with him. Now comes the task of trying to hunt it down and get it back. I actually don't mind it. It means I get to travel all over. Wonder if I'll run into you somewhere along the way. Skyrimush or the Balladeer is the sixth Fatui Harbinger and is the first successful prototype of Raiden A. However, due to his fragile emotional state when trying to house the Gnosis, he was deemed incapable of his initial purpose. Thus, A left him in the Shakai Pavilion. This is where he would adopt the nameless eccentric identity and where he would go on his journey. Scaramouche was referred to as a disheartened eccentric and cast aside like worthless dross. The validity of this claim is unknown, but if this really is how Scaramouche saw himself, then that's actually really sad. Scaramouche's real name, at least the name that he gave himself, is Kunikuzushi, a name from Kabuki theater that represents a larger-than-life villain. The translation of this is Country Destroyer, or the Destroyer of Nations. When he was found by the Fatui, the Harbingers unlocked the sealed power of the Electro Archon and somewhat amplified it through a delusion. Whether it was always his nature or it was something programmed into him, Skarmush is sadistic and relishes in the pained and confused emotions of humans. He believes that emotions spiced up life, despite him being discarded for his own emotions. Skarmush's story is that he wants to feel, and even when he's feeling pain, He's afraid that if he removes the heart the Fatui put inside him, he wouldn't be able to feel anything at all. We don't need to go over his full story again, we have enough videos covering that. So instead, let's go over his future. He is currently missing from the story and has escaped with the Gnosis. At the moment, the Fatui are unable to contact him. And how the Fatui haven't hunted him down is a mystery to me given that the Fatui have ears and eyes virtually everywhere in Tevat. According to the Dore, He's trying to conquer the Divine Gaze before making his next move. And if you've played 1.1, it's possible that Skarmush is trying to understand the fake sky and the machinations of Celestia. However, I won't be surprised if he's somewhere horribly incapacitated after trying to use the Gnosis. Given his mental fortitude probably wasn't strong enough to handle it. I wonder how we'll meet Skarmush again. He's been teased in 2.7 for having story relations with Kaidehara. But the thing is, it was also said that someone a Fatui spy, perhaps, was trying to purge the existence of Kunikuzushi from Kaidehara records. If this was Kunikuzushi or another Harbinger's work altogether is unknown. 
Sandrone. She always seems engrossed in her research. Hmm. I wonder if those machines have anything to do with her. Anyway, I've only met her a few times, but every time she looked like she wanted to murder me. I have no idea what I possibly could have done to annoy her, though. Sandrone, or the marionette, is a design that I absolutely love given that her real-life counterpart is... Well... Sandrone takes a lot of inspiration from Victorian European dolls, from the frills you see on her head and her torso, and the design of the Ruin Guard I will now dub as Bob for obvious reasons. She really gives a vibe of a vintage doll, and I absolutely adore that. But her manner of speaking and reprimanding others is somewhat antagonistic. She was mentioned in Tartalia's trailer as having reprimanded the Fatui agent named Javert, and it seemed that she has a foul relationship with Tartalia. I also like humoring the idea that she has beef with Scaramouche for the sole reason that he's an actual puppet while Sanjorna's origins are unknown. I love the massive ruin machine behind her, something much more complex than the ruin guards we've seen in the past. However, I don't think we'll see Sandrone until very, very late into the story. I would bet that due to her Victorian clothes, she'll be a main antagonist for the Fontaine setting given her motifs of machination, puppetry, and debonair aesthetics match well with Fontaine's. Senora. I never got along with her, you know that. I guess there's not much more worth saying about her at this point. When you're a harbinger, you have to accept that death could come at any time. But don't worry about me. No matter what happens, I'll do whatever it takes to keep myself alive. Senora or the Fair Lady story begins 500 years ago as the Crimson Witch of Flames, a powerful pyromancer who lost her love Rostum to the abyssal creatures of the Cataclysm. Her real name is Rosalind. She was found by Piero in the Stainless Bloom Artifact, and was promised that her past will be sealed away with the Majesty's Ice. Now, she swears vengeance against the short-sighted and ignorant gods, all save for the Saritza who came to her and bestowed her the blessing of the ice. Her cryo delusion hides away the power of the Crimson Witch of Flames, instead of acting as an amplifier. She met her end by the Eternal Traveler's Blade and the Raiden Shogun's Muso no Hitatachi. Senora's future in this game is horribly unknown. The PV is giving mixed signals for her revival given that Senora's motif has a lot of death and resurrection. First is that the moth is a symbol of rebirth, change, transformation, and regeneration, which hints that the flame moth landing on her coffin might mean she'll return. The whole palace being encased in ice, however, might go against this theory, meaning that this is her final resting place because her coffin will be buried in ice and snow, tempering her flames once and for all. However, Piero's dialogue about Checkmate suggests that death is not the final destination for Senora, and he even says that her final resting place is not within the coffin, but will be the entirety of the old world. So it's kind of on the fence if she comes back. Personally for me, I hope she doesn't, just so she gets the sweet release of death and finally be with the one she loves. Pantalone, the Regrader. Oh, now that guy has a head full of grandiose plans fueled by raw ambition. I don't understand a word he says once he starts talking about his theories. Eh, but as long as he keeps our cash reserves stocked up, I'm not complaining. Pantalone is a man of money and the economic genius of the Harbingers. He is in charge of keeping the affluence of the Harbingers and understands how important money is to keeping power. He has a unique understanding of wealth and is capable of monopolizing the other nation's strongest assets to favor the Fatui. For example, an agent by the name of Landa is an agent of Pantalone who was sent to learn more about the wine industry, Mondstadt's largest export and import. If Pantalone manages to grab a hold of that industry, Mondstadt's whole economic independence is subsequently snuffed out. Pantalone also owns the Northland Bank, the largest bank in Liwe. If you somehow establish a bank in the land of commerce, you have successfully controlled Liwe's inner workings. Additionally, it was one of his bases that Yelan infiltrated to get her signature coat. However, Pantalone's upbringings aren't as blessed as his current status. He was once impoverished and believed that the gods are greedy. They do not need money, yet they take it away from those that do. But he swore his allegiance to the Jester, and promised that Snezhnaya will be the heart that pumps money into the world, essentially making Snezhnaya the central strongest economic power that controls Tabat's resources and whatnot. In the trailer, he expresses the classic businessman smile when asking Pulcinella to reconsider the length of the holiday he gave for Senora's death. His true motivations and loyalty to Saritza are currently unknown, and whether this was said out of true grieving or not is questionable. Regardless, I don't trust this man one bit. Though, he doesn't have a vision. His Pale Flame story says that he was never blessed by the gods, and I believe that this would include a vision. 
so in the event that he does receive a vision in the future, it would be horribly awkward. Arlecchino. Look, I've got nothing against people who have their own agendas. I myself joined the Fatui to get more experience in combat. But I don't like her at all. If she stood to benefit from betraying others, she'd turn against the Tsaritsa in a heartbeat. There isn't a sane bone in her body. Harlequina the Neve is actually quite surprising to me given that the Harlequin of the Commedia dell'arte is a much more spry, conniving, jestful, and bombastic character. Harlequina, on the other hand, is outspoken about her distaste of the other Harbingers, yes, but that is merely it. Regardless, Arlequino in the trailer is openly antagonistic to others, and even considers the businessmen of the Harbingers as conniving and incapable of understanding loss. The speech Arlequino gives in the beginning actually ties in very well with Arlequino's operations in the Fatui. Arlequino mentions that Rosalind died in a foreign land, while the other Harbingers enjoy the comfort of their homeland. It's possible that this is a nod to the orphanage that Arlequino has for children of foreign lands that lost their parents. This is what some Fatui soldiers were raised in. These orphans are insanely loyal to Arlequino and decided to take advantage of Senora's death to quote-unquote repay Arlequino's kindness and boost her prestige. The true nature of Arlequino's orphanage is unknown, however, and whether Arlequino's motivations are truthful and honest is unknown. Tartaglia hints that Arlequino's loyalty to Zaritza is intermittent, which means that there is a hidden agenda somewhere in there. Regardless, Arlequino's lines about making these children cry is an amazing nod to the part of that backstory, and given that Arlequino despises the conniving nature of the businessman, maybe Arlequino is much kinder than what we believe. Now we close off with Tartalia. Ajax was once a regular Snezhayan citizen from the fishing village of Morepesok, who dreamed of the mysterious adventures and wonderful bouts of strength that his father told him about. He dreamed of heroes and mighty warriors, until one day at the age of 14, he ran away from home believing that his calling was somewhere else and that he was wasting his time in a fishing village. Unfortunately, as he fled his home, he was chased by beasts in the forest. Trying to run away from them, Ajax fell into a mysterious hole that led him straight to the abyss, and it was here that he trained with a mysterious woman named Skirk and learned the ways of the foul legacy. He trained for three months, but in Taivatian time, only three days passed. But his adventure in the abyss awakened a monstrous bloodlust within him, and he craved for combat everywhere he went. Desperate to seize his son's constant troublemaking, his father asked for the help of the Fatui. Ajax successfully beat all of these seasoned warriors and caught the attention of Polchinella. And thus begins Tartalia's mission in the Fatui. Tartalia's mission is to grow as strong as possible, but he does have his morals when it comes to this. He wants to go in the warrior way, up front, personal, and contested bounds of strength. He's transparent in how he fights, and doesn't really use cheap tactics like Scaramouche to incapacitate an enemy. I think that's why Tartaglia's goal, despite being horribly questionable, is quite admirable, all things considered. But yes, the future of the Fatui is impossible to predict at the moment, but the PV really gives us a lot of hints of what's to come, which I will be dissecting in another video because this one has been going off for too long. Also, while this video covered lore, I'm planning to theorize on the connections of the future Harbingers with the plot and finally put my own speculations. But that's a topic for another day. Regardless, my name is Aster and thank you for chilling with me. 